And it's as if people came to the Buddha and said, Sir, uh, we suffer terribly. And what are we going to do about that? And he replies, is it not true that you suffer because you desire? They said, well, maybe that makes sense. All right, he said, see if you can do without desire. And all those students go away and see if they can calm their desires. They come back and say, this is pretty difficult. Because uh, we are animal beings and we have all these appetites to begin with. And then beyond that, we're in the unfortunate position of being aware of time, being aware of the future. And although it's advantageous to know about the future, in the long run it's depressing. Because we all know that we come to a bad end. And that there everything falls apart in time. And so there seems to be a fundamental futility. Desire, desire for whatever it is that you want. But behind this, the intention of studying desire, seeing whether one can discipline desire, whether one can curb it, is a deeper question altogether, which is, what do you desire? What makes you itch? What sort of a situation would you like? What, how would you really enjoy spending your life? Well, it's so amazing as a result of our kind of educational system, crowds of students say, well, we'd like to be painters, we'd like to be poets, we'd like to be writers, but as everybody knows, you can't earn any money that way. Or another person says, well, I'd like to live an out of doors life and ride horses. Uh, let's go through with it. What do you want to do? When we finally got down to something which the individual says he really wants to do, I will say to him, you do that and uh, forget the money. Because if you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you will spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way.
And after all, if you do really like what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, you can eventually turn it, uh, you could eventually become a master of it. It's the only way to become a master of something, to be really with it. And then you'll be able to get a good fee for whatever it is. So uh, don't, don't worry too much. That, that's, uh, everybody's, uh, somebody's interested in everything. And anything you can be interested in, you'll find others who are. But it's absolutely stupid to spend your time doing things you don't like in order to go on spending things you don't like, doing things you don't like, and to teach your children to follow in the same track. See, what we're doing is we're bringing up children and educating them to live the same sort of lives we're living in order that the, they may justify themselves and find satisfaction in life by bringing up their children to bring up their children to do the same thing so it's all wretch and no vomit. It never gets there. And so, therefore, it's so important to consider this question, what do I desire? Well, when we answer that question in a naive way, we figure out that we want a desire, uh, what we want is to control everything. To create girls that don't grow old, apples that don't rot, clothes that never wear out, conveyances that get from one place to another instantly so we don't have to wait, power available to do anything that you could conceive and do it just instantly like that get this funny technological omnipotence. But if you take time out to think about that and really go into it with your full strength of imagination and find out whether that's where you want to be, you will soon see that's not what you want. you have a situation where you are really in control of things that is to say in which the future is almost completely predictable you will see as I said last night that a completely predictable future is already the past you've had it and that's not what you want you want a surprise you don't know what that's going to be, because obviously it wouldn't be a surprise if you did. 
You want a pleasant surprise. But like you say, what sort of a surprise would be pleasant? And you can't really answer that. Because you know, if there are to be such things as pleasant surprises, there must also be unpleasant surprises. There must be rude shocks. So you're like somebody taking a, one of those wishing well boxes, you know, tubs, you know, where you fish in and you bring out a package. And you don't know whether you've got a dead rat in it or a new camera. <laughs> And that's the way, that's, that seems to be the thing that really excites people. Supposing I have a, I'm an alchemist, and I have a whole secret closet full of love filters, very potent ones. If I see a desirable woman, all I have to do is to offer her a cigarette or give her a glass of wine with one of my secret potions in it, and instantly I'm her master. Now, what, when I think that through, what would I do with a situation like this? <laughs> because all I've got again is that plastic doll that when I push it, it does what I tell it to and doesn't have any comeback. What you always are looking for in things is where the surprise is there, where there's a comeback. And you say, my God, this thing is alive. It has a will of its own. It is not in my control. And I would like to have a relationship with something like that because it would never be dull. And therefore, in the exploration of what you want, you get to the point where having all pleasures at your command and they pall and you think of new sources of pleasure. And eventually you get like the ancient Romans who had all these mad crowds of barbarians who had to go every Saturday to the Colosseum for a show that really had to surpass everything. Because they had public baths, they had prostitutes, they had every kind of luxury. But when they went to see one of the big shows that people like Nero put on, they would have, for example, floats circling the Colosseum, all full of slave girls from distant parts of the Mediterranean, garlanded with flowers and waving at the crowd and going innocently around. And the next minute they would release wild lions into the arena to eat up all the slave girls. They got a big sadistic kick out of that. Because you see, pursuing pleasure beyond a certain place takes you into what the Buddhists call the Naraka world. That is to say, the hells. When you have explored pleasure to its ultimate limit, the only thing you can get a kick out of is pain. And so naturally, you descend from the Deva world at the top of the wheel to the Naraka world at the bottom, where it shows all these beings in, in states of torture. Now, of course, the, the priests say uh, when they're bringing up children, if you do bad things, you will end up in the hell world. But this is a very uh, inadequate way of showing how one gets to the hell world. You get to the hell world 
as a result of not knowing what you want. As a result of thoughtless pursuit of pleasure, which ends you eventually in the pursuit of pain. So when you're in the hell well, that's where you want to be. So then, we ask the question, uh, if the motivation of power gaining disappears, you've seen through it and you know that's not what you want. What other motivation takes its place as the origin of actions? And it seems to me that the answer here is compassion. When you want to relate to another living being, what you really are asking them is that they be in the same situation that you are. You want to meet and encounter someone else who has your problems, your fears and your delights. You don't want a doll, you want another you another self because that would be at least as surprising to you as you are <laughs> and then you think no I don't want to control these people because we always hope that the things that we do for each other will be pleasurable to both sides let's take in, uh, in, in sexuality where you get a kind of a critical example of this the biggest fun in sexual relationships is giving orgasm to women and if that doesn't happen, uh, many men feel disappointed. Because the thing that they really wanted to do was to give pleasure and get their own pleasure out of giving it. Now that's compassion. In the real sense of the word. Feeling with and through someone else where the whole trick is that you lose control for a while of the situation and say, I throw the ball to you, now it's yours. When the Christian speaks of God giving the creature freedom of will, the Hindu says, no, God gets lost in that person and gives up power. It's, it's really the same thing. It's the, the idea that the all-powerful surrenders power. So that uh, the more you give the power away, what you're really doing is you're othering yourself. Now, the more you other yourself by giving power away, the more of a self you are.
So you find that people who through a sadhana, a yoga discipline, have overcome their ego, have transcended the ego, are tremendously strong personalities. You would think, theoretically, they would all be non-entities. And to lack entirely what psychologists call ego strength. But actually, they're nothing of the kind. They are, every one of them, unique. They're all quite different from each other. And they are very, very, uh, what I would call, strong characters. Because the more they have given it up, the more they get it. put it in another dimension for the moment. Let's suppose we, we are thinking of a relationship that is not just a people. People are very obviously other and independent of one's ego. But give it to everything. Say to everything, which in course is going to include as much of, your, of yourself as you can objectivize. Say to it all, now it's your turn. Let's see what you're going to do. Let it happen. And you find you get the sensation that, the, that, that everything else is living you. It lives you. In giving away the control, you got it. You got the kind of control you wanted. That's to say, where you had a loving relationship to the world, but you didn't have to make up your mind what it should do. You let it decide. Lao Tzu puts it in this way, the great Tao flows everywhere, both to the left and to the right. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. And when merits are accomplished, it lays no claim to them. The more, therefore, you relinquish power, trust others, the more powerful you become.
this seems a sort of paradox to say this, but the principle of unity, of coming to a sense of, of oneness with the whole of the rest of the universe, is not to try to be, obtain power over the rest of the universe. That will only disturb it and uh, antagonize it and make it seem less one with you than ever. The way to become one with the universe is to trust it as another, as you would another, and say, let's see what you're going to do. You do not know where your decisions come from. They pop up like hiccups. And when you make a decision, people have a great deal of anxiety about making decisions. We're always worrying, did I think this over long enough? Did I take enough data into consideration? And if you think it through, you find you never could take enough data into consideration. The data for a decision in any given situation is infinite. So what you do is, you go through the motions of thinking out what you will do about this. And then when the time comes to act, you make a snap judgment. <laughs> <laughs> but we fortunately forget the variables that could have interfered with this coming out right. It's amazing how often it works. But warriors are people who think of all the variables beyond their control and what might happen. Then what is happening is this. The more you let go of it and trust it, as if it were quite other than you. The more you realize the inseparable identity of self and other. Ananda Kumaraswamy once described the life of the liberated being as a perpetual, uncalculated life in the present. And you say, wow, I don't think I could do that. And I've never met a preacher yet who would uh, really take that up.
they all say, well, of course, that's too hard a saying for most of us. Uh, it's not practical. Everybody has to uh, take thought for tomorrow and uh, calculate. Whether you like it or not, and whether you know it or not, the relationship between you and the environment is always one that is harmonious. So in the same way, you are always living the uncalculated life. You have to find out, first of all, that you're always doing it. And that what you call your calculations, uh, the things you did, were funny little rationalizations. In other words, your ego has about as much control over what goes on as a child sitting next to its father in a car with a plastic steering wheel. What do you want to do? Do you want to live your life in such a way that you're always saying to it, mm, mm, yeah. you know? Do you want to? Is, is that a good way to conduct things, or do you want to live your life in such a way that you 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 say, "Come on, let's go." You see, let, let's 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 swing this thing. On the one hand, you see, you're always in tension against it. Do you remember I pointed out to you in, the, in this morning that the person who's anxious, constantly anxious, is the person who is resisting the flip-flop ability of things. Life is vibrating. It's going blip, 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 blip all the time. And the anxious person says, God's sake, don't do that. Because, you know, <laughs> you might do it too much. <laughs> I don't want to blip like this. It makes me feel nervous. <laughs> Stop it. And so, as he puts his weight on this blip blip, he goes... <laughs> This man figured out a few things as to how to make a balsa wood raft to sail from South America to the Pacific Islands. But once he had set this in motion, he discovered that all sorts of unexpected factors cooperated with him. That when the wood got wet, it expanded so that the ties bit into it and held it completely secure. He had never expected that. And he found that as he sailed along, a flying fish would simply alight flat on the deck every morning for breakfast. 
that all kinds of natural factors. It was just he 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 touched a key where he was flowing with the course of nature, and everything cooperated with him because he had touched the key. He had made the act of faith. So when I ask, I go right down to the question. It should be started with, "What do I want?" The answer is, I don't know. When Bodhidharma was asked, "Who are you?" which is another form of the same question, he said, "I don't know." Planting flowers to which the butterflies come, Bodhidharma says, "I know not." I don't know what I. When you don't know what you want, you've re reached the state of desirelessness.
when you really don't know. But you see, there's a, there's a beginning stage of not knowing and there's an ending stage of not knowing. In the beginning stage, you don't know what you want because you haven't thought about it or you've only thought superficially. Then when you, somebody forces you to think about it and go through and say, yeah, I think I'd like this, I think I'd like that, I think I'd like the other, that's the middle stage. Then you get beyond that. Say, is that what I really want? In the end you say, no, I don't think that's it. I might be satisfied with it for a while and I wouldn't turn my nose up at it, but it's not really what I want. Why don't you really know what you want? Two reasons that you don't really know what you want. Number one, you have it. Number two, you don't know yourself because you never can. The Godhead is never an object of its own knowledge. Just as a knife doesn't cut itself, fire doesn't burn itself, light doesn't illumine itself. It's always an endless mystery to itself. I don't know. And this I don't know, uttered in the infinite interior of the spirit, this I don't know is the same thing as I love, I let go, I don't try to force or control. It's the same thing as humility. And so the Upanishads say, if you think that you understand Brahma, you do not understand and you have yet to be instructed further. If you know that you do not understand, then you truly understand. For the Brahman is unknown to those who know it, and known to those who know it not. principle is that any time you, as it were, voluntarily let up control, in other words, cease to cling to yourself, you have an access of power. Because you're wasting energy all the time in self-defense, trying to manage things, trying to force things to conform to your will. The moment you stop doing that, that wasted energy is available. And therefore, you are, in that sense, having that energy available, you are one with the divine principle. You have the energy. When you're trying, however, to act as if you were God, that is to say, you don't trust anybody and you're the dictator and you have to keep everybody in line, you lose the divine energy. Because what you're doing is simply defending yourself. So then, the principle is, the more you give it away, the more it comes back. Now you say, I don't have the courage to give it away. I'm afraid. And you can only overcome that by realizing you better give it away because there's no way of holding on to it. 
The meaning of the fact, you see, that everything is dissolving constantly, that we're all falling apart, we're all in a process of constant death, and that uh, the worldly hope men set their hearts upon turns ashes or it prospers and like snow upon the desert's dusty face, lighting a little hour or two is gone, you know, all that Omar Khayyam jazz. <laughs> Know, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the great globe itself, I, all which it inherits, shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. All falling apart. Everything is. That's the, the great assistance to it. See, that, that fact that everything is in decay is your helper. That is allowing you that you don't have to let go, because there's nothing to hold on to. <laughs>